All right, there you go. <laughs> Good morning, Lakeside. Good morning, Lakeside. What a glorious, beautiful day it is here to be at the side, the Lakeside this morning. It's great to see all of you and your, your faces in their places. What a wonderful day it is. And on behalf of Pastor Randy B. Kelly, we just want to thank y'all for coming out. And um, we hope that you get your praise on. We hope that you the message will be heard. And we ask that y'all continue to pray for the people in Houston, well, in Texas, that are going through a whole lot right now. Uh, the um, That's just very devastating. I cannot believe what has happened to the people in Texas. This is Black History Month, and we just want to acknowledge all the people that came before us that have made such a wonderful, wonderful impact on our lives. Some people that were right here at this church um, that really did some wonderful things. So we just want to praise them for what they've done. I want to give a special shout out to my granddaughter, Kana, Kana Lynn is 13 years old today, so she is a officially a teenager now. Yeah. This this is my first teenager to have. And uh, that's something. It's really not my first teenager, but you know what I'm saying. What a wonderful blessing it is. And uh, when I called her this morning, of course she was in bed, but <laughs> she was still asleep. But that's okay. I mean, because she's a teenager. Amen. So we just ask for your prayers for so many people this morning, all of your uh, health care providers who are still struggling on the main line to provide uh, COVID relief for those that are in need. And we pray for our teachers this morning. Teachers having to, yes, yes, having to deal, and the parents of those teachers having to deal with this new normal as far as getting getting uh, our, 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 te our, um, our students taught. Uh, we, need to get, we need those people doing what they need to do to get back to work, but we need to be safe, all right? Amen, amen. What a glorious day it is. We're gonna get started here at Lakeside. for all of the people that have come before us. Because we as a people, we have come this far by faith. Come on, somebody. We've come this far by faith. Oh, leaning, leaning on the Lord. Oh, and trusting in His holy word. That's all we did. He's never failed, he's never failed me yet, and I'm glad. I said, whoa, I can't turn around, we've come this far. Never, never fail me yet. I 
No doubt we have been through some things, y'all. But even through it all, we're still, we are still, we're still right here. We're still standing. Amen. We are still standing. Another song I want to dedicate to Black History Month. After you've done all you can do, you got to stand this morning. Hallelujah. What do you do when you've done all you can? Seems like it's never enough. And what do you say when you're Friends turn away, you're all alone, all alone. Tell me, what do you give when you've given your all? And seems like you can't make it through. How you just stand when there's nothing left to do. Just stand and watch the Lord see you through. Yes, after you've done all you can, you just stand. For the people in Texas, tell me how can you handle the guilt of your past? Tell me how do you deal with the shame? And how can you smile while your heart has been broken and filled with pain? So much pain. Tell me what do you give? What do you give when you give it your all? And seems like you can. And wonder what's the Lord see you through. Yes, after you've done all you can, you just stay and be sure. And don't you be, and don't 
after you've done all you can. Hallelujah. After you've gone through the hurt. You see, I've been there. After you've gone through the pain. Oh, oh my. Hallelujah. After you've done all you can. It is now prayer time at Lakeside. Reverend Bradford. Reverend Bradford in the house. go to God in prayer. Our Father, our Father, we come to you this morning on many occasions and for many needs. We ask you, Lord, to search our hearts this morning. And if there's a sin that is as small as a mustard seed, I pray, Lord, that you blot it out. Come, Holy Spirit, right now in this place, somebody is in need of you. Come, Holy Spirit, right now in our homes, in our vehicles, in our country, somebody is in need of you. Church, our wound that broken spirit, Lord, sometime up and sometime down. And sometimes we find ourselves almost level to the ground. But we know, Lord, that you don't give us more than we can bear. We know that you are a loving God, a God who cares about us, who watch over us both day and night. And so, Lord, we just here to, to let you know, Lord, that without you, we will be nothing. Without you, we won't make it. Come, Holy Spirit, and surround us, our family, our friends, our community, our country. Take away, Lord, whatever hindrance that stand in our way. We ask you, oh God, that you will remove them. We ask you that you will just use us according to your will. But Lord, sometimes the road gets so rocket. Sometimes the mountain seems so high. Sometimes we come to the crossroad of life. And we just don't know which way to turn. 
But Lord, you ain't known one thing that you are a preacher of a troubled water. You are a rock in the weary land. So Lord, bless us. Bless us, Lord. Use us. Endow us with your spirit. We pray to God for our pastor and his family. We pray for the church family. Help us, Lord, to look up to the hills uh, from whence coming our help. Help us to always count on you because one thing we have come to realize, and that is, you never fail. So thank you, God. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for putting food on our table. Thank you, God, for washing over us both day and night. Help us, Lord. When we don't find our way through, Lord, help us with a sense of direction. Help us with energy and, and, and use us according to your will. We pray, oh God, that you would, you would just bless us each day as we talk about you, as we pray to you. We ask it for your continued blessing, your amazing grace. Touch us, O oh God, and use us in ways that you have never used us. But Lord, we know one thing, that you not only you never fail, but you are a God of love, love to every single one of us. So Lord, give us hope when we are hopeless. Give us strength when we don't have strength. Give us an eyes to see and ears to hear and feet to walk on. That we may behold your glory. Lord, we just thank you. And as we, we come to the close of this prayer, Lord, we ask that you, O oh God, to walk with us and talk with us. This is what man folks said, Lord. We ask that you to talk to us. We ask that you to walk with us. Because by walking with us and talking to us, may we understand that you are still in charge. May we realize that, that you are a better one, the best friend, the best one we can ever have besides us and with us. And so, Lord, we just thank you. Help us, Lord, to never, ever turn away from you. Because sometimes we know we, we feel discouraged. We get disappointed. But Lord, we know you never disappoint us. Help us, Lord, when we feel discouraged to always call on you. Because we know with you all things are possible. This is our prayer, Lord. We ask in your name and for your sake. Let everyone pop their horn. It is now time for our offering. Let us pray, most gracious and loving Father, once again, we just thank you for the gifts that we are about to receive, Lord. May they be used for the uplifting of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Brothers and my sisters, it's not about me no more. For any of those who've ever been changed, have you been changed, honey? Oh Lord, yeah. we say it like this: Jesus, I like what you're doing for me. You saved me from my enemy, and you gave me the victory. Yes, you did.
Yes, I do. Yes, I do. When Jesus came into my life, he changed me. He brought me into the light, and I'm a witness. Yes, for all he has done for me. Originals. Thank the Lord. Brother Collins, we got it. it. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Father, it is indeed a privilege and a pleasure to be able to give back what is rightfully yours, Lord. Take these blessings, take these gifts, and let them be used for the uplifting of your kingdom this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts and mind for the Pastor Randy B. Kelly. That's the next voice you're going to hear. Amen. Make some noise. Come on. Let us give a great big horn honking to Preston for leading us. Amen. I want to thank Terry for last week. 
fact, she was she was singing so good. I thought that was a, a tape. Amen. She had that song down pat, but an on time God. Yes, he is. Amen. Let's give her a great big horn honking. Thank Terry. Thank EC. Thank Tiffany. Thank all of you who are streaming, sharing, liking and also other mediums of social media. Uh, again, tomorrow I will be uh, lecturing for the City of Gaston, a Black History program at the Gaston City Library at 5.30, which will be Facebook Live as well as on Zoom and perhaps other mediums. I want to thank, uh, well, actually, I want to make a notation of Sonny Rooks. He has a very talented daughter. Amen. She is a, a superstar basketball player. And he'd be right there, too. He'd be right there filming and, and taking pictures and all that. Proud daddy. Let's give him a great day. Oh, I want to look at word for Daniel 79 and Revelations, first chapter. 14, 13, 14, and 15th verse. Revelation. I don't want to hoop and howl and run up and down the parking lot like I normally do. But I want to just concentrate on teaching today, if that's all right. Amen. Daniel 79. It says, I beheld the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and hair of his head like pure wool. Revelation, first chapter, 13 verse, it says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot and girdle about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and hair was white like lamb's wool, as white as snow, and his eyes was as a flame of fire, and his feet was like unto fine brass as if it was burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And this is a word from the original African Heritage Bible by, edited by Dr. Cain Hope Feldes, who was taught by my Old Testament and Blacks in the Bible professor. And so I want to talk with you today from the subject Black people in the Bible. Black people in the Bible. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who is credited as being the founder of Black History Week, which morphed into Black History Month, thought that the problem was inadequate education. And uh, thought that the, the, the uh, problem was not having opportunities for education. But he found out that the problem was not not having uh, avenues and opportunities for education, but the problem was having miseducation or false education. Because you can have all the education you want. You can have more degrees than a thermometer and be as crazy as a ham sandwich. I thank Henry Louis Gates for the documentary on the black church, but in our experience, it was wonderful. Let's give him a horn hunking in his house. But we do know in our experience there was people in our churches who went overboard 
They spent their hard-earned nickels and dimes to send people to college. And when they came back, they was crazier than the people who was trying to keep us down. And Grandma and her crowd used to call these folks educated fools because they expected them to use their education to help them, but they used their education in order to hurt them. Just like the folks we have always had to fight against. And this miseducation did not limit itself to the academic arena. It affected our churches because as black people, we are considered very religious people. I was looking at that Bonner report the other day and it was talking about that more of us believe in our preachers than any other race in America. Some 64%. But why is it that we're so religious that we know very little about black people in the Bible? When I came here to Lakeside, I was very impressed because you have a picture of a black last supper of Jesus and his disciples. And I noticed a few weeks after I got here that it was the same picture that I had put up in my office. Why is it that you won't find pictures like that put up in our sister white churches? Why is it that many of our black churches still have white pictures of Jesus? But you don't have white churches that have black pictures of Jesus. Why is it that we're the only people on the earth that put up a picture of a God and a Savior that look like our former slave masters and enslavers? And so, when I talk about black people in the Bible, I'm talking about people who are traceable black. They have so-called black blood in their veins. They have black characteristics. They come from black places. They have names like Cush, Cushion, Keto, or on the basis of physical, archaeological, historical, cultural studies that can be used to determine that they are black people. Such as the Bible describes Pharaoh Tehaka as a Cushite, Elijah as a Tishbite, David Mellon that I preached on since I've been here as an Ethiopian. And in this country, the races always remind us that if you have one drop of black blood in you, you're black. Simply because the black gene is the dominant gene. You can get all kind of colors from black, but you can't get black from white. And when we look at the story of Joseph, we find that Pharaoh gave Joseph a wife who was the daughter of the priest of On, or Heropolis. And her name was Asenath. Together they had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. The Pharaoh was black. The priest was black. Asenath was black. And I need to tell you that Joseph was black. The children, Ephraim and Manasseh, was black because... They had a black mama, at least an outright black mama, and they became two of the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph was black because his father Jacob was not born an Israelite. Jacob was not born a Jew. Jacob was born a Syrian through his black Canaanite mother named Rebekah, who was born 
in Syria, which was called Ham. Ham means black is burnt by the sun. It was called Aramea. And it was called Northeast Africa. And you might say, can you prove that? Yes, I can prove it. If you go to Genesis 24 chapter 10 through 38 verse, Deuteronomy 26 chapter 5 verse, you will find that Rebecca ancestry can be traced back to the Hittites and the Amorites who is traced back to the Hamites or Ham who the Bible says is the father of all African nations or by looking at Judges 3rd chapter 5th through the 6th verse Ezra 9th chapter 1st and 2nd verse 10th verse 14th through the 19th verse 44th verse or Ezekiel 16 and 1. Jacob's black-skinned mother, Rebecca, his wives, his concubines, or his girlfriends, as we call it, his father-in-law, as well as his brother, as well as his uncle Laban, were never Jews or Israelites. They were black Syrian Canaanites. And if you trace the genealogical table in the 10th chapter of Genesis. You will find out that the Canaanites came from Ham and he was the son of Noah. And I know what you're thinking. Jacob became Israel. It is, but it's a difference between becoming something and being born something. Becoming Israel means that God changed his name, which means God changed his nature. Like Abram's name was changed to Abraham, like Sarah's name was changed to Sarah, like Paul's name was changed to Saul. But if you look at Strong's Exhaustive concordance, number 38, 25, and Genesis 25, 20, Genesis 32, 28, Genesis 35 and 10, Ezekiel 16, 1 to 3, they all will tell you that Jacob himself was a black skinned Syrian as well as his 12 black sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel as well as his daughter named Dina. You know, I uh, travel a lot and I sometimes I see trucks that have a sign on the back of it and it asks the question, how am I driving? I just want to ask y'all the question here, drive in, how am I driving? You see, Joseph was black because that's why his brothers, his own brothers, went to Egypt twice and talked with Joseph twice. But they could not recognize Joseph among those other black Egyptians because they all looked the same. During their meeting, Reuben and his brothers thought that Joseph was another Egyptian. In fact, that's why they went back and reported to their father. They said, we talked to the Lord of the land and he spoke roughly to us. You will find that in Genesis 39 and 1 and Genesis 42, 1 through 30. And you can recall how Joseph had to tell his brothers who he was. When he said, I am your brother Joseph who you sold into slavery. And then when it got frightened, Joseph told him, be cool y'all. I know y'all. Y'all meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so I come this morning to tell you that this Bible is a black history book. From one cover to another. 
and, 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 and we, we find 90% of all the action in the battle happened among black people. There are 950 references pertaining to Africa with names associated with Ham, Cush, Ethiopia, Egypt, Put, Canaan. According to the Bible, the creation of Adam and Eve happened in Africa because the Bible says four rivers came up out of the garden. The Pashon, the Gihon, the Hevla, the Euphrates, and the Pashon, and the Gihon is the blue and the white now sometimes called the upper and lower now that runs through Egypt and runs through Ethiopia. And the Havila is named after a black man named Havila. And the major biblical cities of the Bible does not have Jewish names. They have African names like I, Bathsheba, Baruch, Gilgal, Hebron, Joppa, Mamre, Sidon, Tyree, Salem, and the holy city, Jerusalem, was found by a black man named Jebus. Now, I don't want to give y'all too much medicine today. See, because too much medicine is worse than no medicine at all. Now, if the doctor tell you to take two pills, and you go home and get crazy and take the whole bottle, you'd be better off without that medicine. So I don't want to drop too much medicine on you. Let me tell y'all major figures in the Old, the major figures in the Old and New Testament. Both Moses and Jesus had to hide in Egypt, which is in Africa, and only separated partially by a man-made ditch called the Suez Canal. This is where Moses and the children of Israel had lived for 430 long years. Don't you know they had to be copper toned to the bone? In fact, Moses is not a Hebrew name. Moses is an African name. And Moses had to be black because they hid him in Africa at birth. And he hid as a grown man. And a white man hiding in Africa is the same thing as a white man hiding in Northeast Huntsville. He would have stuck out like a so thumb. Moses was hanging out with the brothers when he killed that Egyptian. He grew up in Pharaoh's household. The name of the Pharaoh, according to scholars, is Ramesses II, who was a descendant of the son Misraim of Ham. And Ramesses' name is translated Egypt or Cam, K H. A-M or C-H-A-M, which means hot again as burnt by the sun. And Moses performed a miracle by sticking his hands in his bosom. And it came out white. If he had been white and stuck his hand in his bosom and it came out white, it wouldn't have been a miracle. And, and, and this brings us down to Jesus. Who, who, and who descended from Noah's son, Ham. And his sons, Cush, and Egypt, and Put, and Canaan, because you will find an Old Testament genealogy in First Chronicles. If you got an ink pen, write it down. Just First Chronicles. First Chronicles, the first chapter. And the genealogy in First Chronicles, the first chapter, the first 
through the 16th verse. And the genealogy in Luke's gospel, the third chapter and the 23rd verse. And Matthew's gospel, the first chapter and the 16th verse. These genealogies are congruent. In fact, the one in Chronicles talks about who would be in the Messiah bloodline who we call Jesus. In fact, it is filled with black people. It was prophesied that Jesus would come out of the house of Judah. Judah, again, was the son of Jacob, who I just told you was black. And you have Boaz, who was a black Bethlehem tonight, which used to be pronounced as Bethlehemite. And he was married to a black woman named Ruth. You will find Rehoboam, the son and successor of King Solomon, who descended from Rahab, a black Canaanite. You will find Azza, the son of and successor of Amaziah, and his black Jebusite wife named Jacola. And in the first chapter, the first verse, Zephaniah let the cat out the sack to let you know that he was black when it says, I'm the son of Cushion. And the word Cushion come from Cush, and it also means black. He is a descendant of Queen Jezebel and a daughter of Ethaliah. And you will find David. Matthew begins his genealogy by saying Jesus was the son of David in the first verse. And this is because they believe that the Messiah will come up out of the house of David. Would be the seed of David as well as rule over the kingdom of David. And look how in Matthew all four women in Jesus' genealogy, in the first chapter of Matthew, are all black. The third verse, Matthew, first chapter, it says, Judah followed Perez by Tamar. In the fifth verse of the first chapter of Matthew, it says, Salmon fathered Boaz by Ruth. In the sixth verse, Matthew, the first chapter, it says, David fathered Solomon by Bathsheba. And Rahab were, and Tamar were Canaanites. Ruth was a Moabite. Bathsheba was married to Uriah and she was a Hittite and the Canaanites, the Moabite, and the Hittites again are traced back to the Hamite or Ham in the 10th chapter of Genesis. And the word Ham means again, black is burnt by the sun. And some for other, oh, that's Mary's family tree. That's not Mary's family tree. That's Joseph's family tree. And that other men don't hold in the water. Because it's virtually without disagreement that both Mary and Jesus came out of the house of David. Look at Luke. First chapter, 27 verse. And Luke. Second chapter and fourth verse, and this blood relationship between Mary and her both father David is corroborated in other scriptures like Luke, the first 
chapter 32nd verse and 69th verse and Matthew 9th chapter 27th verse and Matthew 15th chapter 22nd verse and Matthew 20th chapter 30 and 31st verse, verse and Mark 10th chapter 47 and 48th verse that Mary would be a woman who would physically mother Jesus was prophesied in David's line foreshadowed the prophecies that promised the Messiah was to be the very offspring of David and his successor to David's throne. That's found in 2 Samuel 7 chapter 12 verse 1 King 8 chapter 25th 26th verse Isaiah 7 and 2 13 14 Isaiah 9 and 7 Jeremiah 23 and 5 33 15 17 22 25 through 26 and John 42 and Mark 11 and 10 was written by a black man named Mark. The book of Mark was written by a black man named Mark who was born in Alexandria, Egypt, wrote his gospel in Rome and died back in Alexandria, Egypt, back at home. And in 2 Timothy, the apostle Paul wrote, Jesus descended from David. And in Romans, the first chapter, the third verse, Paul went on to say that Jesus Christ was descended from David according to the flesh. And in Revelations 27, chapter, the 15th verse, Jesus says himself, I am the root and the offspring of David. And this proves according to to the genealogical tables that Jesus had black blood in his veins. You know, I could have mentioned Moses' family members, how they had black names, how they was over the priesthood of Israel. I could have mentioned how Sigma Freud, the father, of psychoanalysis wrote a book called Moses and Monotheism where Freud himself said Moses was a black man. I could have told you that the emperor, the Roman emperor Justinian had a coin made with his picture on one side of the coin and his picture was white and he had a picture of Jesus on the other side of the coin with curly hair because Jesus was black. And that coin is still in the British Museum. And that is in accordance with all of the images of Jesus. The image I just read in Daniel 7 and 9, but also Daniel 10 and 6, Ezekiel 1st chapter 26, 27 verse, and the passage I read in Revelation, first chapter 14 through the 15th verse, all say the same thing. He had hair like lamb's wool and feet like polished bread burned in the oven. And in case you don't know what hair like lamb's wool is, feel right back here, past that wig, past that weave, past that temporary permanent. What grandma used to call the kitchen, and you'll find all the lamb's wool you can handle. Those pictures was not changed until the 15th century. Under Pope Julius II, who commissioned Michelangelo to change those pictures in the 16th, 16 chapel from black to white, and later on, Raphael and Leonardo da Vinci was commissioned to do the same thing, but as I'm preaching right now, the Pope in Rome has a black Madonna, a black Mary, 
in a black Jesus. There are over 800 documented uh, uh, Marys and Josephs of black Madonnas all over Europe and Asia where I have been blessed to travel. And so I said all that to say this. One of the first churches I pastored when I when I got there it had all kind of white pictures on the wall. God and Jesus. And I went out in the community with a team and, and with our team we knocked on doors and the community was transitioning and, and we brought out uh, brought in a lot of members. We brought in more members in a month than they had brought in in many years. And I brought in as a member a former football player, still a good friend of mine, Bob Lowry, who gave me his condominium to stay in just so I could do my doctoral dissertation. And one day I was preaching on the black ancestry of Jesus, and the next week I came back, all those pictures had been changed from, from white to black. And when my district superintendent came, he came on some other business, and he saw those pictures, that man almost had a stroke. He almost had a hussy when he saw all those black pictures of Jesus. I did a talk with some white preachers, and they were so shook. It was one black dear friend of mine, and uh, one lay person who was a secretary, and of course she said, like they said, they'd never heard that before. They were so shook up, they wanted me to take them to the lynching museum. I was a part of a biracial committee, it's supposed to be working on diversity, and we came out of one of these big churches and just a handful of black preachers in, in the group, and we supposed to be the leading preachers in the city so-called leading preachers. And, 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 and when we came back down into the sanctuary, there was a big picture hanging up there of a white Jesus. And the preacher said, isn't that a beautiful picture of Jesus? And some of my black colleagues said, yeah, that showed up a beautiful picture. And then asked me, he said, what do you think about it? I said, first of all, I think it's the wrong color. It should be black instead of white. And they never invited me back to the meeting again. <laughs> and the church I pastored in the Birmingham area, as soon as I was assigned to another church, the pastor of that church told me that one of the mothers of the church had told him to call me and come and pick the pictures up because they didn't know what color Jesus was. But now, it wasn't no problem with Jesus as long as all of those pictures were white. They didn't know what color it was. he was then, evidently. But why is it that they had to get rid of them because they were black? Amen? Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it wasn't a problem with those white pictures. There's a problem with the black pictures. And some would argue, well, it don't make no difference what color that picture is. Well, if it don't make no difference, why would they change in the first place? Yeah, when I was in Gaston, I shared with you about how a radio station owner gave me a talk show, daily talk show called Tell It Like It Is. I call it the Tell It Like It Is because in the 24 hour period that he asked me to come up with a name, the only thing I could think of was what my church members would tell me in our worship, in the call and response. They would say, Tell It Like It Is, Reverend. So I called the talk show Tell It Like It Is. And one day I was talking about this subject, about Jesus was black. And a white gentleman from out of town, he called in and said, No! You, 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 you trying to 
divide that city. Well, he didn't live in the city. And then another one called in and said, no, Jesus wasn't black. Jesus was olive color. And a sister got on her phone, black lady got on her phone and called in on a cell phone and she said, well, if he was olive color, well, what color do you think an olive is? A green olive is dark green. And a ripe olive is jet black. And, and, and lastly, there was a play in New York City of a black actor that played Judah years ago, Judas years ago. And he got a standing ovation before a packed house at Madison Square Garden. That same actor played the devil before a packed audience at Madison Square Garden in New York. Got a standing ovation. But when that same black actor, they announced that he was going to play Jesus. There were some businesses and corporations threatened to boycott the play, and the man got death threats on his life. And so, I want to ask you, how is it that people can get so happy seeing us play sellouts? People can get so happy seeing us playing the devil. And they can get so upset when they see us playing Jesus. It is because of what I said in the beginning that Dr. Carter G. Wilson, he talked about miseducation, not only how Black people have been miseducated. White people have been miseducated. And I close with some interesting experiences I had. I've had with my baby daughter, Jemiah, who has shown off a little fighter. On the way back to Gadsden from where I pastored before I came here in Southeast Alabama, Several years ago, she was telling me about her history class and the things that they were learning, the things they were studying in school. And I believe this time it was world history. And she began to talk about the people that they were studying. And I asked her, I said, darling, did they tell you that all these people you're talking about were black people? And she said, no. And I said, get on your phone and start Googling. And while my wife was driving, me and her was in the back, she was Googling and I was talking. And I started talking about the great kings and queens of Africa, queen like Queen Nzinga, Queen Nefertari, Queen Nefertiti, Queen Cleopatra, kings like Manson, Newson, Norma, Khufu, Utmost, Utnatham, and who was the first known believer in one God, King Zasha, Hamlet, Baca, and Hannibal, who defeated the Roman Empire and conquered Spain, who is studied in every war college in the world. And he took elephants from Africa and made them cross the ocean and climb over the Alps mountains and elephants are neither water creatures or mountain climbers. He shook up the entire Roman Empire and they inhabited Spain for 600 years. I told her about Ian Holter who was the first doctor, the father of medicine and his symbol. Diane is still being used today and the great African civilizations like Mali, Sangay, and the University of Timbuktu, how Africa civilized the world, brought Europe out of dark ages into the Renaissance, and she would Google them up. And then, before we ended the con conversation, she said, Daddy, tomorrow, I'm going to school and turn my history class out. 
And they stayed in Gaston. I went back down to my church. And the next morning, I called my wife real early. And I said, darling, what you going to be doing at lunchtime today? And I told her, she said, why? I said, because if Jamal tell those folks at that school all that stuff we talk about, they're going to kick Jamal out that school. You had to go over there and get that lunchtime. And uh, sure enough, they had a debate. And it was a stop down, knock down, drag out, slap down debate. And the only two children were left in the debate was Jemiah and a little, little boy in an overwhelming white school. And the teacher had to end up stopping the debate. And then when she was younger, when I passed it in Anderson, this black historical Bible I just read from, I was given one by the radio station, only one by the mother of the church. She loved that Bible. She would go in that Bible and look at those black pictures or those black images. And when she get down and looking at the pictures, she would ask me, Daddy, show me Jesus. I had to show her the picture of Jesus. Daddy, show me Jesus. And after I showed her Jesus, the picture of Jesus in that Bible, and about 30 minutes later, she was saying, Daddy, show me Jesus. I had to show her Jesus again. And it's interesting that she did not ask Show me Snoop Dogg and Dog. Show me Nicki Minaj. Show me Little Ray Ray, Little Wayne, Little Boo Boo, Little Bow Wow, or Little anybody else with Little Sis. She said, Show me Jesus. <laughs> And that's what we need to show our children. We need to show them Jesus. Because they can't be what they can't see. I'm going to drop the mic now. I'm going to drop the mic now. Amen. I, I love all of y'all. Uh, thank you for all your faith, your faith and your commitment. And thank you for what you meant to this, not just this church, but this entire city. Great honor in serving here. Church of one of my mentors again, Reverend Dr. Joe Joseph Eckers Lyra, who became a not just a civil rights leader but a world leader. And I pray God that you will get the tape. EC records these tapes and study that tape. There's a lot of information in it. And that's just a, just scratching the surface of it. And I pray God that we study, but I think it's a crying shame that we can hoop and howl and foam at the mouth and run up and down the aisles of churches and throw away empty pocketbooks and know something about everybody else in that Bible but ourselves. It lets me know that we're still in the dark. Amen? And, and if a man is not going to treat you right, he's not going to teach you right. Because teaching you right is much better than treating you right. Amen. Let me share this again. As I always share, life is not a spectator sport. Get in the game, play hard. And for God's sake, don't let anybody beat you loving your people. And now to you and now to him. 
who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his throne of grace with power, majesty, dominion, now, henceforth, and forevermore. Let us all say, Amen.